will fill the shelves. Good morning and welcome to Grace Bible Fellowship. Good morning. Good morning. And some of you are visitors with us and um, yeah, this is how it is. <laughs> this, is this is the way that it is. It's, it's a very loose group that we have here. This is, this is not what's called high church. High church is, you know, liturgy and a lot of bum da bum da bums and, uh, you know, languages that you don't know. We, we don't do that. We, we speak in English and we have fellowship and we love each other. Amen? Amen. And that, that's just one of the things that I love about this place. Guys, let's pray. Our Father. We come before you this morning and after worshiping and declaring that we won't lean on our own understanding. Lord, we turn to you. We look for you and for your word to be preeminent in this place, that you would be our singular vision, that we might become like you, that as we look into the face of Jesus, that we might become more like him. And so, Lord, as we open up your word I pray that you might unlock its mysteries, that you might excite our hearts, that you might capture our minds, and that you would help us to bring you the glory that you so deserve by the way that we live and the way we react to your truth. I pray that you help us to reverence you in our hearts and minds at this time. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, we're back in the book of Matthew. We're in chapter 8. We're going to finish just the last few verses. I'm sorry, Mark. We know where you are. I've been everywhere today. I read some interesting passages this morning that are kind of sticking with me, and I have a passage in Matthew that's going to format itself here, so I have that in my head. Forgive me. It is the book of Mark. It's a four-letter word. I'll just add it to the others I know. That's what I usually do when I introduce myself. Hi, I'm Dave. It's a four-letter word, and it's used that way sometimes. So we're going to get into Jesus and what he explains a true follower of him is. You know, most, actually, did you know that Christianity is the largest religion here in the United States? At least by people who claim to be Christians. But of course, if you ask people for a definition of that, they'll tell you that means I go to, you know, church on Christmas and Easter. Uh, so that not necessarily, but Jesus lays it out a little bit differently in Mark 8 31. It's at this time he began to teach them that the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. And after three days rise again, Jesus is explaining his mission now, he's, he's roughly halfway through his ministry, and as they're looking toward Jerusalem and his final sacrifice on the cross, he's preparing his disciples. And aren't you glad when God prepares you for things? We have a budget, and we put money aside for when our cars break down. And I'll tell you what, before we did that, it was a mess. You know, we'd have a big breakdown, or we'd need tires or, or something, we'd have to take it and put it on credit which is stealing tomorrow's money for today. And, oh my goodness, then we have to pay that off. And then, you know, there's the interest rate and all of that. It's so good to have it put aside. And then it's like, oh, we have a need. Oh, it's good. We just so happen to have X amount of dollars. It's like, why didn't I think of this when I was younger? But Jesus is preparing his disciples so that they don't have a triggering, uh, it doesn't have a triggering effect on them, which we see Peter didn't help him too much. He ends up pulling his sword out and cutting somebody's ear off in the middle of all of that, not knowing what to do. And he tends to stick his foot in his mouth, just like us. So we're going to take a look at some of those things. So last week we were in the first half of the book of Mark. And I, Mark 8, and it was all about bread. And so we got to see Jesus feed the 4,000 in a largely Gentile area, in the Decapolis area, the 10 city area, uh, on the eastern shore of Galilee, where there were a lot of Gentiles. So it was different than the 5,000. The 5,000 were Jews primarily. These 4,000 were with him for three days. And he was afraid to let them go. And he looked for faith in his followers, and he just found this fear of foodlessness. Well, you guys know you were here last week. 
So with the feeding of the 5,000, the, immediately they go to another place on the, off the, the lake and the Pharisees come up to Jesus and they say, listen, we want you to do a miracle for us. Like what? The, the hundreds I've already done, that's not enough for you? That's not enough proof? It has to be a prescribed, you know, it can't be a card trick, right? So uh, not one of those. And he says, you know, no sign is going to be given to you except for the sign of Jonah, who was in the belly of the well for three days and three nights. And then, of course, he was vomited up. And Jesus himself said, the only sign that's going to be given to you is my resurrection, that he, you will destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. And then on the way out, away from the Pharisees, he tells the disciples, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of Herod. And they had a guilty conscience. They're like, oh, he's saying that because we didn't bring any bread. And Jesus asks them the nine questions. What? Are you kidding me? Do you not have ears? And you don't hear? You don't have eyes? You don't see? You, you don't perceive? You don't understand? Wait a minute. When we fed the 5,000, how many loaves did you have? Five. That's right, you had five loaves, and I fed 5,000 people. Okay, great. And now, with the 4,000, how many did you have? Ten. Okay. So why do I need your bread? They had a guilty conscience because they didn't get what Jesus was saying. They took it wrong. And we talked a little bit about communication, how somebody might pitch you something, but you catch something else. Any of you have? It's not just me, right? You say something and you trip on a mine and, and suddenly somebody blows up on you. Have you ever had that happen? It's so fun. I said sarcastically. And so Jesus is wondering, what, you guys still don't get it. You don't see, you don't understand what I'm trying to tell you. So this week we're going to be in chapter 8 from verse 22, beginning in verse 22. And he came to Bethsaida, and they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. You know, the funny thing about the scriptures are, is that they're so incredibly deep. You can just read a narrative and just breeze right through it and miss things. You guys ever miss things when you read through the Bible? And then you go, where did Pastor Dave find all this stuff? Well, it's right here. It's in the Bible. You just have to read it. And so I got a couple of questions for you. Number one, who are they? And then he came to Bethesda and Bethsaida, and they found, they brought a blind man to him. Who's they? Inquiring minds want to know, who are they? And why is he blind? Because we see blindness is a real big problem throughout this area. And Jesus healed lots of blind people and were given explanation. In fact, the disciples taking an opportunity to have a big theological conversation in front of a man who was sitting begging, who was born blind, said to Jesus, Jesus, what do you think? This man sitting here, this poor vessel you see before you, was he born blind because of his own sin or was it his parents' sin? We always want to find somebody to blame. And the disciples were good about asking that question as well. And he goes, neither of those things. It's so that the glory of God might be shown through him. How is the glory of God shown through him while he's blind? Well, because he didn't stay that way. The reason that he was blind is so Jesus might come along one day and heal him. And God would get glory for the healing. That was the purpose for him being blind. This man, we don't know why he's blind, do we? Apparently they, whoever they are, came and found a blind man. It might have been his disciples. It, there are at least three disciples that are from this area. Peter's one, Philip's the other, and the other one I didn't write down, so I forgot. That one fell off the back shelf. So they're from this area. So it very well could be that the disciples came, but look, they begged Jesus to heal him. They begged Jesus. I wonder, how many, how many people do you pray for where you beg God to restore? That takes a pretty big heart. Not many of us have that kind of heart. 
I, embarrassing to say that's me as well. Well, this is, this is where Bethsaida is, up here in the northern region where they're talking, and uh, I'm going to answer these questions. He comes up, he's a blind man, and they beg that he would touch him. I wonder who the they are in your life. Who brought you when you were blind to Jesus Christ? How cool it is to have people that love you enough to tell you the truth, that you're blind and that you need to see spiritually. I wonder, who will you be the they for? How many people will you bring to Jesus Christ and beg him that he open their eyes? Why is he blind? I don't know. Why were you? Why were you spiritually blind and lost in your sin? There's all sorts of reasons. If you're sitting here and, be, and you know the Lord Jesus Christ in a personal relationship, it's the same reason as the man who was born blind, so that the glory of God might be shown through you. And so that you might bring glory to God. He created you. You're his creation, as we all are. But not all of us are his new creation. Not all of us are born again. Not all of us are sons of the Most High God. And so my question is, why were we blind? I know that I heard the gospel many times before I accepted it, but there was a time when God quickened my heart and it was plowed and ready for the seed of salvation. And are you glad that God did that work? So why keep it to yourself? So when you love people, blind people, you bring them to Jesus, right? You become one of the they. You bring them to Jesus. And I hope you plead. Amen. I hope you beg. I hope you prevail upon God's goodness and his grace. In Exodus 4.11, just a bit of theology for you. If you're wondering where people come from, why do people have so many troubles? Why are there difficulty in this life? Why are there all sorts of things, maladies in this world? I want you to remember this. So the Lord said to him in Exodus 4.11, who has made man's mouth or who makes the mute or the deaf, the seeing or the blind? Have not I the Lord? God takes credit for everything. Just want you to know that. Whether you have an ability, by the way, that's an endowment. You didn't earn it. It's an endowment. You have the ability to remember things. Praise God for you. You're going to make up for people like me. <laughs> if you have knowledge, it's an endowment, not an earning. Moses was trying to get out of being God's man. He says, listen, I want you to go back and deliver my people. And he goes, abba, abba. I'm not a good speaker. I'm not like, you know, Zig Ziglar. I can't do that. And he goes, who do you think made your mouth? Who makes everybody everything? So, you know, you really have no excuse if God calls you to do something because where he guides he provides. And so you don't have to be worried about stepping up and doing something which the Lord has prompted you to do. And we can do it with great confidence, not in ourselves and our own understanding, but in him. And so they took the blind man, he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. Now you probably see this a lot in towns like this with blind people, somebody leading them because Having a stick or a dog isn't going to cut it out in the woods, out in the country. And so there are lots of people that would lead other people by the hand. And Jesus takes this blind man by the hand and leads him out of town. And when he had spit on his eyes, no wild gasp, <laughs> and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything. Now, if you know anything about the scriptures, this is weird. If you know anything about spit, this is weird. If you've ever been spit on, you know this is weird, right? You guys are less weirded out than I am. So in my keeping and asking questions, why did he lead him out of town? He led him out of town because Jesus wasn't doing it for the crowds. It was personal. 
He did it for this man. And it's always personal, isn't it? If Jesus is going to spiritually open your eyes, it's a personal thing between you and him. It's not a public proclamation. It's a personal thing. And so Jesus leads him out of town because he's going to heal him. And so the way he does it is a not expected way. He spits on his eyes. Now, the original language, if you're careful and you look, it means that he spit on his eyes. <laughs> and I wish I could unlock some truth that said it was something else. Why spit and hands? Two, like two, two, like, you know, my big fat Greek wedding. And then hands and spit. It's, I mean, a good mother would not do that to her kid, right? I've, I've seen mothers go <laughs> and wash something off a kid's face. Don't, just get a paper towel and some water, you know. It's, it's, I understand the pressure and people are looking at my kid and all that, but don't do that. Because, see, whatever your breath smells like is what's getting on their face, and they'll have to smell that. I know this from personal experience. But why spit and hands? I just wonder, is there anything he can't use? Is there anything too low that God can't use? It used to be believed that the the spittle of a wise man had properties to be able to make people see. I think it was a metaphor. Uh, there's also some stories about a guy named Horace and Set, and Horace's right eye got pulled out. Anyway, it's a whole thing. But Jesus spit on his eyes. Now, if you go back to chapter 6 in Mark, Jesus used spit before. He spit on the ground, I believe. And he touched the tongue of a guy who was deaf and mute. He couldn't speak and he couldn't hear. And so Jesus was touching his ears and then was, and, he, and then he touched his tongue. He goes, oh, whatever's in there, I'm going to get it out. Okay, you get it? He's using sign language to communicate. But this is Jesus spitting in his eye, which is perhaps where the comment came from. There's, here's spit in your eye. I don't know. How many of you ever heard that saying before? Or am I just too old? Oh, okay, good. Here's spit in your eye, and, you know, and you're going to drink. Anyway, is there anything Jesus can't use? And see, they begged Jesus, please lay your hands on him, and they had the idea that that's how Jesus did it. And then the next thing you know, they're spitting in, he's spitting in their buddy's eyes. You know, it might be uncomfortable to come to Jesus, and he might do some unexpected things to you. like spit in your eye. And it's rather interesting because after he does this, he asks him if he saw anything. Now, when Jesus heals people, he does it long distance. Hey, by the way, you have what you asked for because of your great faith. He does it by a touch. He even got a, he even got a miracle stolen off of him once. When the Syrophoenician woman came behind him and said, I know if I just grab the hem of his garment, I know I'll be healed. And she was. And Jesus stopped in the middle of the crowd and said, somebody touch me. And Peter said, Lord, everybody's touching everybody. He goes, no, I felt the power go out from me. And he turns around and there's this woman and she confesses. It was me. And, and everybody looked at her like, oh, that's the bleeding woman. She's been bleeding for 12 years. She's unclean. And she touched Jesus. Well, Jesus isn't unclean. She's clean. Because what Jesus had wore off on her, not what was on her got off on Jesus. So they got taught a lesson. Why ask if he saw anything like he's some kind of an optometrist or an ophthalmologist? Is this better or worse? <laughs> When Jesus heals somebody, they, he heals somebody. Never in the history of the scriptures has anyone said, hey, listen, how's, how's the spit working for you? See anything? There's an optometrist, an op ophthalmologist, and then there's a, some other guy. 
Anyway, I, I don't know the difference between all of them. I'm sure that one of you will tell me immediately. No, but it's okay. I don't need to know. But Jesus is saying, do you see anything? Well, the guy is blind and you just spit in his eyes and, and touched him. So I imagine he sees, you know, can, can you read the third line down for me? I find this very interesting because this has never happened. Jesus is doing something new here that he's never done before. And that always makes me go, yes, just like that. And I think, and I think Jesus does it so that we do that, so that we don't get stuck, so we're not the people to spit in your eye healing or, or the, the mud on the ground in your eye healing or the uh, speak it from afar healing or whatever. D Jesus can use anything even spit. I see that when God created Adam, he used his breath. And it says that he breathed on man, the breath of life, and he became a living being. He breathed a soul into his creation and God used his breath. It's a way of putting a piece of himself in man. So I think back to that. I don't know if that helps you with the spit. <laughs> and the man, he looked up and he said, I see men like trees walking, which tells me this guy used to see. This was a progressive thing that happened. He once saw because he knows what a tree is. He knows what it looks like. I mean, if you were blind, you'd be able to go and touch a tree and you'd get the idea that it was like, a tree trunk, unless you were hugging an elephant, and they, they feel the same. But he knows what a tree looks like. He looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. And then he put his hands on his eyes again and made him look up. And he was restored and saw everyone clearly. And he sent him away to his house saying, neither go into the town nor tell anyone in the town. What? You think I'm going to keep this a secret? I was blind begging on the side of the road, and I'm going to keep this a secret? How's that going to happen? Well, why did he have to touch him twice for a complete healing? Did he not plug his phone in overnight? Did he have a low charge? <laughs> so, you know, the spirit wasn't flowing through Jesus that day, or... Am I the only one asking these questions? Apparently. Okay. <laughs> so why did Jesus have to touch him twice? Let me ask you a question. Why would he want to keep it a secret? Well, let me give you two possible answers. How many times has he had to touch you? There are some people, when they get saved, they are, they're on fire for Jesus, man. And they, they're memorizing scriptures, they're in the word, and they're asking good questions like, why did Jesus use spit? You know, and people take off. And some, of, some people have addictions, you know, cigarettes or drugs or, you know, alcohol, and it just drops. Pornography, Done. It's over. Never again. And just people take off and you're like, why did I have to get touched by Jesus more than once to drop this stuff? I think he's a picture of some of us. How you doing? Well, I see men like trees walking around. You're going to need a little bit extra. <laughs> I was one of those. I was like this guy. And you know what? I'm still like this guy because I need Jesus to touch me every single day or I'm going to lean on my own understanding. Lord Jesus, touch us again over and over and over until we see clearly. Why the secrecy about the healing? I don't know. Why such a secrecy about your transformation? Why doesn't the whole world know what happened to you? I understand why Jesus told him to keep it a secret, because then he becomes a sideshow. 
he becomes someone who comes, he's just basically a hospital and everybody's going to bring people, you know, heal him, heal him, Jesus. Oh, he's healed. Thank you. And they're going to run away. Jesus's job was not to come and heal everyone's physical infirmities. His job was to preach the good news, the gospel about who he is and why he came. That was his whole purpose in coming. And if he turned it into a sideshow, people would only come for what they could get out of him. And he would tell people, hey, don't tell anybody. Shh, keep it a secret. It's going to be a mess. There'll be people all over. We won't be able to walk. We'll be like this. And then somebody's got to grab me by the coat to get healed, you know. Jesus didn't want that. That's why he walked him out of town. He didn't want a spectacle, which is a beautiful thing. Jesus said, if you're going to give, don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. Give in secret, and your father who sees openly will reward you. You see, it's not about showing off. It's not about playing to the crowd. It's not waiting for CNN to come for an interview. Jesus had compassion on this man, and it was between him and this man, just like it's between him and you. Isaiah 35, 5 then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Prophecy about the Messiah who would come. In Psalm 146, 8, the Lord opens the eyes of the blind and the Lord raises those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. Jesus came to open eyes. You remember in chapter 7, or I'm sorry, uh, earlier in chapter 8, the disciples were asked, don't you have eyes and you still don't see? And the next thing Jesus does is heal a blind man. Jesus brings that sight. He brings it physically. He brings it spiritually. These are all the other passages talking about blindness in the scriptures. I know you can't read them. <laughs> But I just want to let you know I researched this, and this is the only passage, Mark is the only one who writes down this account of this particular blind man and this double dosing. He got a booster. In verse 27, now Jesus and his disciples went out to the towns of Caesarea Philippi, and on the road he asked his disciples, saying to them, who do men say that I am? Well, that's interesting. What do people say about me? You know, you'll never know unless you ask somebody else that question, right? And still you might not know, right? I'll ask my wife, hey, what do people say about me? She goes, oh, you really don't want me to tell you. <laughs> no, 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 I do, I really do. Well, you asked for it. But Jesus is saying, what do people say about me? Now, imagine they're in this Caesarea Philippi area. There are idols everywhere. There's people worshiping all kinds of idols. And Jesus is asking them what they think about this. Jesus has taken them into a very decidedly Gentile pagan area. And he stands as a stark contrast to everything around them. Who do men say that I am? It's what's your identity, Jesus? Who, who are you? And what do people say? Do you know this is the biggest test question of your life? Who's Jesus? Right? This is the only question on the test, boys and girls. Who is Jesus? And your answer to that will determine your eternal destiny. Who is Jesus? Not how good you've been, how many nice people you helped, how, whatever. None of that matters. What matters is who is Jesus. Here's what some people say. This is Richard Dawkins. Any of you know Richard? Yeah, tell him I said hi if you see him. He says this, the idea that God could only forgive our sins by having his son tortured to death as a scapegoat is surely, from an objective point of view, a deeply unpleasant idea. If God wanted to forgive our sins, why didn't he just forgive them? Why did he have to let his son be tortured? This is from a non-believer, a combative non-believer, Richard Dawkins. Do you have an answer for him? 
This is from Patrick Henry. My most cherished possession I wish that I could leave you is my faith in Jesus Christ. For with him and nothing else, you can be happy. But without him and with all else, you'll never be happy. Those are two contrasting views. Einstein. As a child, I received instruction both in the Bible and in the Talmud. I am a Jew, but I am enthralled by the luminous figure of the Nazarene. It says, have you uh, read a book on Jesus? And said, yes, Emil Ludwig's Jesus is shallow, is, is shallow Jesus and too controversial for the pen of, see, my eyes are gone, so. Phrase mongers, thank you. I knew it when I read it previously. However artful, no man can dispose of Christianity with a bon mot. That means with a, a clever saying. That's French, by the way. I looked that up. <laughs> you accept the historical existence of Jesus, and he said, unquestionably, no one can read the Gospels without feeling the actual presence of Jesus. His personality pulsates in every word. No myth is filled with such life. So he believes the scriptures are a true statement of who Jesus is. Did Einstein have personal faith in Jesus Christ? He comes short of that, doesn't he? He's a historical figure. It's read with passion. Nobody else can write like that. Fiction isn't written like this. So he says all of these really good things, but he hasn't committed his life to Jesus Christ. H.G. Wells, I'm a historian, I'm not a believer, but I must confess as a historian that the penniless preacher from Nazareth is irrevocably the very center of history. Jesus Christ is easily the most dominant figure in all of history. He stops short of accepting Jesus Christ as his boss, as God the Son, but he does recognize the veracity of his existence. Darwin, Charles Darwin, maybe you heard of him. I'm sorry to have to inform you that I do not believe in the Bible as a divine revelation and therefore not in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. I'll bet he's sorry now. <laughs> the interesting thing is Charles Darwin at the end of his life actually repented. And you can read the story if you want to look it up. Anyway, so what do you say about who Jesus is? <laughs> Jesus asking the question, who do people say that I am? Well, people say all sorts of things about Jesus, right? He was a true historical figure. He was a passionate person. He was a healer. He was a teacher. He was a, a, a religious figure. People have him as all sorts of things. And what you answer before the presence of God before you get there, is so vitally important. So Jesus continues, so they, meaning Peter really, <laughs> they, the people, his disciples, answered him and said, John the Baptist, and some say Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said to him, you are the Christ. And then he strictly warned them that they should tell no one about it. Again, this peculiar secrecy. Jesus is, the very first time Jesus is explaining to them who he is very clearly. The first person in the book of John was the woman at the well. And Jesus said to her, you know, go get your husband and bring him back. And, and she says, I don't, I, I'm not married. And he goes, you're right. You've had five husbands and the guy you're living with, he's not your husband either. So yeah, you're unmarried. She says, well, I perceive that you're a prophet. Um, hey, our forefathers used to, you know, they worship in Jerusalem. You Jews, you're so cocky. You think we should be in Jerusalem, but we worship on this mountain. He goes, I'll tell you the true worshipers of God are now going to worship him in spirit and truth. And as Jesus is explaining all this, she goes, well, when the Messiah comes, he'll explain all this to me. And he says, the one who's talking to you is he. The very first time Jesus proclaimed himself to be the Messiah, and it was to a Samaritan woman. And the disciples were far away. There again, Jesus had a personal 
relationship one-on-one -on -one with this woman. And he risked his reputation by a man speaking to a woman and a Jew speaking to a Samaritan. Matthew gives us the fuller picture because Matthew, Matthew gives us the bigger picture instead of Mark. Mark gives us kind of the highlights. You are Jesus the Christ. Okay, well, that's quick and easy. This is Matthew's take on it. He gives us the fuller picture. Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Well, that's a bit different. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, that means the son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. By the way, that faith and that knowledge is an endowment by God. And I also say to you that you are Peter, Petros, Rocky. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So Jesus said a considerable amount after that and he didn't just say, you're the Christ. He says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, putting Jesus on equal par with the father. That declaration was saying, Jesus said, that's what I'm going to build the church on. That statement, not Peter. He says, you, you, Rocky, I'm going to build my church upon that rock, the rock, the foundation that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. That's what the church is founded and based upon not on Peter as our high apostle, as our high priest. He had to get saved just like the rest of us. And Jesus began to teach them that the son of man, by the way, that's a messianic title. Daniel uses it. Jeremiah uses it. Must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the scribes, and be killed and after three days, rise again. He spoke this word openly. Now, we know that this is Peter dictating to Mark, and Mark's taking all this down. Jesus said, I remember when he first said this, and he said it openly. It wasn't with a, a metaphor or a simile, or a, it, and we didn't get it. You're going to see later on, they didn't get it. He told them over and over. He's going to tell them in another two chapters and then in another four chapters, and they don't get it. He says, I'm going to raise on the third day. They're going to put me on a cross and kill me, and then I'll be back in three days. And they were like, I'm sorry, what? Because their expectations were so broiled in their mind that a savior would come, the Messiah, the Mashiach would come and free them from the slavery of Rome. And every time they read the scriptures, the blind will see. Oh, that doesn't mean spiritually. That means physically, right? It's both, actually. It's interesting how we can get so ingrained in our own mind and make up our own mind what the Scripture says and eisegesis the thing and push it into the Scriptures. Need to be careful to pull it out. So he spoke this word openly, and this is the first time that Jesus actually dropped this truth bomb and said, this is what's going to happen. So Peter took him aside and he began to rebuke him. I want you all to go, ooh. Do you ever take, you ever take God and say, listen, I, apparently you don't know this. <laughs> See, you, you don't understand. You, you, you don't understand. You're not getting me. You don't know how important this is to me. You don't know how I'm suffering. You think Jesus doesn't understand? <laughs> so Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. <coughs> You're a little slow there, people. <laughs> Peter began to rebuke him, but when he had turned around and looked at his disciples... He rebuked Peter, saying, get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Well, that's a little spooky. 
Peter, who said, you are the son of the living God. And he says, upon this, I will build my church and you'll have the keys of the kingdom and that which you bind will be bound in heaven. And uh, he gives them all of that. And then Jesus says, um, by the way, now that you know who I am and you've made this large attestation, guess what? I'm going to be delivered over to the chief priests, the scribes, and to the Romans, and I'm going to be crucified on the cross, but I'll be back in three days. And Jesus said, no, no, Lord. Those are two interesting words put together. No, Lord. <laughs> because Lord means you're my boss. You tell me what to do. You say jump, I say how high. And he's saying no. Right? No, Lord. <laughs> Get behind me, Satan. Now, he turned around and he saw the disciples probably look with big eyes and they were probably all going, oh. <laughs> and he said, get behind me, Satan, because he spoke to the spirit behind the words. He spoke to the spirit behind the words. You ever had somebody come up to you and tempt you in some way, shape, or form? You know, you could speak to the spirit behind the words. <laughs> I, I do that all the time. I get tempted to say something or do something, and I have to say, Jesus didn't save me for that. Jesus did not save me for that. And so that's not going to happen. So, I can imagine him in today's language and theology saying, you have to stop that negative profession, Jesus. You're creating your own reality. And many of you may have read books that say in Christianity that you speak things into existence like God did. And so Peter would have been right in that camp. Practice the law of attraction, Jesus. Say good things and only good things will happen to you. I, I hope I'm not offending people like I think I am. Practice the law of attraction. Or maybe it's don't let the devil get you down in the dumps, Jesus. That doesn't have to happen. Practice some positive affirmation. Do you think Jesus speaking positive affirmation is going to change his mission? Of course not. Do you think it will change yours? This is the sin of Peter. Proclaim positivity. Think good thoughts, positive things. This is what Peter's telling him. Speak good into existence, Peter, or uh, Jesus. Speak it into existence. If you say it, it'll happen. If you blab it, you can grab it. <laughs> Listen, you, you might think it's funny, but there are people that do this. And it's the power of positive thinking. If I just think positive thoughts, good things will happen. Good things happen because God makes them happen. Every good and perfect gift comes from the father of lights in whom there is no shadow of turning. And so God is the endower of those things to us. Perhaps counseling, perhaps Jesus, you need some counseling to change the way you're thinking, or maybe some medication or some deep meditation, some positive meditation, or just love yourself, Jesus. <laughs> just love yourself, doggone it. <laughs> Get behind me, Satan. Rehearse it with me. Get behind me, Satan, because I will do whatever God calls me to. And if he calls me to a cross, I'm going. No amount of positive thinking is going to undo God's plan. Like Jonah. Hey, Jonah. Yeah. I want you to go to Nineveh. Tell him to repent because I want to save these people. No. And he walks away. And the Lord said, this could go easy, but I guess it's going to go hard. The Lord brought a storm, and then he brought a submarine. <laughs> Beware of living your best life now, because that means you won't have a life later on. Just figured I'd put that in there. When he had called the people to himself and his disciples also, he said to them, 
whoever desires to come after me must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. So Jesus said, our life is about denying ourself and living for him. It's not about living for me. And God is the celestial resource for me to enjoy my life. The only way you're going to enjoy your life is if you're doing what the Lord calls you to do. If you take a screwdriver and you try to use it as a hammer, you will find a lot of displeasure. <laughs> if you take a hammer and put screws in, you also will have displeasure. The hammer is only good when it's hammering. The screw gun is only good when it's putting in a screw. If you get that messed up and you think God is a resource for your life, then th you think God's your servant and he's not. You're his. Amen. Jesus said... You want to be my disciple? This is what waits for you. Jesus wants all of us, not part of us, not a little ingredient to mix into your life. He wants all of us. If you desire to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, which you are if you're a Christian, that's a Christian's a disciple, a disciple's a Christian, then you have to decide to deny yourself. You have to deny yourself. It's not like, well, for Lent, I've, I've denied sweet things, and so <laughs> I've denied myself, and so I'm like, no, it's not deny it, and, and I deny myself meat on Friday, and I just eat fish. Um, or shellfish is okay, right? <laughs> well, okay, well, it's not talking about bits and pieces. It's, you know, and, and I did miss two meals the other day, so I'm fasting, so <laughs> it's not that. It's denying yourself. It's about self getting down off the throne. You are not the center of the universe any longer. Jesus is. I am in orbit around him and you. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. I am to orbit him and you, not me. I'm not the center. Jesus is and you. Unless you're in my life and then you orbit me. <laughs> You've got to dethrone your drive. You can't have ambition for yourself and say, you know, I've got a, I've got a five-year plan. This is what I plan on doing and I'll be a millionaire in another five years. Did Jesus tell you that? No. Then you're rogue. And this could go easy. You have to die and be directed. You have to die to that, give it to him. With an open hand, you go up the mountain. We just sang it. You die to that. And I'm going to live for you, Lord. You tell me what to do. You tell me where to go, and I'll do it. Otherwise, I'd be in corporate America making a lot of money. But I'm here because God's called me to be here. And I hope the same is for you, that you're willing to die to whatever plan you have with your own self and say, Lord, what do you want me to do? And I'll do it. You tell me what to do. You want me to be a missionary? I'll drop it all right now. You want me to leave my house, my home, my family? Whatever you want me to do, Lord, I'll leave. I'll do whatever you want me to do. And I'll tell you what, that's where joy is. Joy is when a hammer is just ringing on a nail. Ping, ping, ping. That's joy for a hammer. Living your life you will lose. If you're going to try to scoop up all the toys and happiness here in this life and have your best life now, you will lose your life. Jesus said so. And so we don't live our lives that way. Jesus tells us the cost of living life that way. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. Those are some strong words. I think of my friend Ebenezer Scrooge. <laughs> Ebenezer Scrooge was a miserable, and I know he was a character, you know, it's Dickens, and I get it. But he personifies people 
who think that there's pleasure and there's life in money. And this guy had no life. He had no family because he had no room in his heart for people. All he had room in his heart for was greed. And he had to be broken down in the story. You know the story. And finally at the end, what a blessed end it is to that. If you've seen the movie or if you've read the book, what a blessed end where he is giving glory to God and he is generous and he, he doesn't care about himself anymore. He has compassion on other people. God really made a change in his life in that story. And it's a great, great picture. And Jesus says, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? You know, people have answers for that. How much money would it take for you to be bought? Or how, what kind of pleasure would it take for you to compromise on your relationship with Jesus? It's a good idea to self-assess that. And remember, I have to go to him with open hands as I go up the mountain and say, Lord, this is all yours. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do. So I, I take a lesson from that story. And I think if you're going to just grab for this life and all the gusto, you better get used to disappointment. The, the, the words of the dread pirate Roberts. I'd like you to consider this. The value of anything is measured by what a person is willing to give to possess it. The value of a thing is measured by what a person is willing to give up to possess it. Let me ask you, how important is Jesus? His value is infinite. So should be all that we give him. And what did God do to possess you? He came himself personally in the person of his son. That's how valuable he thought we were. And so that's Mark chapter 8. Next week, we're going to be in chapter 9. And we're going to begin to see Jesus in his true identity, who he really is. We're going to get a little bit of a... the the curtain is going to come down and we're going to have a view of who Jesus truly is in his personhood and his identity on the Mount of Transfiguration. So I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. A, a time like this is important because we get to kind of uh, put a handle on things and decide we're going to take them with us. If the Lord has spoken to your heart in some way today through his word, I want you to remember it, kind of put it Put it in a container and take it with you. Because I think so often what happens is God speaks to us in a place like this, in a time like this, and the Spirit puts things upon our heart, but we don't consecrate it to Him. So I want you to pray for me, pray with me for a moment as the worship team gets ready. Let's pray. Father God, these things that you say in your word through your Son are so deep and so vital. And Lord, the biggest question that we can ask is, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus to me? I hope that every soul within the hearing of my voice can say, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Lord, we know that you came, that you sacrificed yourself for our sin, that you took the punishment that we have earned. And I pray, Lord, for those who may not know you, that you would touch their eyes, their spiritual eyes, that they may know you. Those of us, Lord, who may be grasping onto things that we should let go, teach us, Lord, to pick up the cross and follow after you so that we might be fully functioning in the purpose in which you've called us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.